You can reach them by mastering the following people skills. Paul demonstrates here and gives us an example of skills we can acquire, develop, and eventually master that we might reach people we come in contact with every day. The first skill we can master is that of captivating their attention. Paul somehow, some way, captivated the attention of people he came in contact with. Absent uh, of the lights and the glamour and the show, Paul did not have the blue and the red lights shining as he was preaching. He did not have, like Katy Perry, the music and the voice and the good-looking body and the, the nice skimpy outfit that has kids today. I mean, they look at Beyonce and they look at Michael Jackson. They look at all these things and that would captivate their attention. I mean, there's everything out there that can captivate the attention of a young child. And when you see the lotto, that captivates the attention of you and me. That 360 million, I mean, that just, that turns us on. But Paul, he had something special about him that captivated the attention of everyone he came in contact with. He did not have the lights. He did not have the glamour. But what did this man have that captivated the attention of others? We see in verses 1 through 7. That Paul, he said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul had a message that esteemed reproach for Christ. Paul did not sit there and give himself a pity party. He did not focus on being locked up in a prison cell and say, Lord, feel sorry for me. Hey, y'all feel sorry for me. Won't you send me some money? No, Paul said, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was glad about it. And he esteemed reproach for the Lord Jesus Christ. When was the last time we picked our head up and stopped dragging our hands around and let people know that we don't got it bad. We don't have it half bad as the sinners down the road. We do not have it half bad as those suffering down the road in sin and in darkness. But we have the Lord of glory. We have been rescued from sin and shame. It's time we rise up and say, I've got it good because the Lord has been so good to me. We must esteem reproach for Christ. The reproach we suffer for Christ's name, we must esteem it and we must convey to sinners everywhere that the Lord has been good to us. We must captivate their attention, not only by esteeming reproach for Christ, but also verses one through four, we see Paul establishing rapport in Christ. He says, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer and to our beloved Aphia and our, our kids us our fellow soldier and to the church in thy house grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ I thank my God mentioning of the always in my prayers now tell me this how could you refuse to listen to a person that said he prays for you every day I mean how are you going to turn somebody away that said he's been praying for you each and every day you know I know a lot of y'all pray for me but I know one person that prays for me every day that's my Aunt Bobby. My Aunt Bobby rolls out a list every day with your name on it, my name on it. Before my daughter was born, she put her name on it. And every day she prays for us. How could I refuse her if she said, Joseph, I'm homeless and I need a place to stay? What am I going to tell her? Am I going to turn away my Aunt Bobby that prays for me every day? No, sir, I'm not going to turn her away. But that's how Paul, he captivated the attention of others. Why? Because he was interested in others. He let them know. He said, hey, I'm going to establish some rapport with these people. Paul said, I'm going to win them to myself first. And let me tell you, if we're going to win them down the road, if we're going to win them across town, we're going to have to let them know we care about them. Truth Missionary Baptist Church is going to have to be the church that lets every sinner or no, hey, I care about you. I care about where you're at. I care about what you're going through. And if you ever come to this church, there's open arms for you. That's got to be our disposition for others. Me and Brother Frog, we were witnessing last summer at a man's house and there was a no trespassing sign on his yard. I didn't care. I just went right up in there and I said, I'm going to break the law. So I went into the man's yard and I said, hey, sir, we're here to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're out in the community to witness for the Lord. And we just want to know if you know that you're going to heaven for all eternity. And that feller said, I'm not interested in anything you got to say. I said, okay, I think I better leave. 
But then Brother Frog chimed in. He said, sir, you got a nice garden there. And you know what? That man's frown for me turned into a smile for Brother Frog. You know why? Because Brother Frog established some rapport for himself in Christ. And Frog was able to give that man the gospel. And if we're going to be able to, to obtain the opportunity and, and to capitalize on all the opportunities that are out there to win the loss for Christ, we must establish some kind of rapport with them for Christ. We cannot be the, the church that tells them to move, move out of my seat. That's where I sit. And expect them to come down the altar and accept Christ as Savior. But we're going to have to say, hey, why don't you come in? Why don't you come take my seat? Why don't you come sup with us? Why don't you come spend some time with us? I know somebody that loves you. And I, I know somebody that can fix your family. Hey, I love you and I'm here for you. Can we be that church? Can we be the kind of church that reaches out to others because we care about them and establishes some kind of rapport in Christ? That's what Paul did. But not only did he captivate their attention by establishing rapport, he also encouraged the religion of Christ Jesus in verses 5 through 7. He said, Hearing of thy love, church, and of thy faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed in thee. He said, hey, you're doing a good job, church. He said, hey, y'all are preaching in Jesus' name. You're helping those down here. You're helping those over here. You're, you're helping the bereaved. Hey, good job. Hey, when's the last time we told each other you're doing a good job? When's the last time you told your choir director he does a good job? When's When's the last time you patted Donna's back and said, hey, you're doing a good job week in and week out. You're doing a good job. Hey, if we're going to be a good church, if we're going to reach others, we're going to have to be a nice and sweet church. My mama always told me you get more with sugar. Did you not, mama? You get more with sugar. And if we're going to get more, if this church is going to grow and if we're going to glow for the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be sweet and kind to one another. The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ gave these words to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.32. He said, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, we've got to forgive others. And we must show them the goods. We must show them that we have something they want. You know, Eliezer was sent down by Abraham in the Old Testament. And Abraham told Eleazar, he said, you find a bride for my son Isaac. So Eleazar trucked down in his limousine of that time. He was in a limousine and he rolled on down and he saw the one he wanted. And he said, that's the one for Isaac right there. And he told her, he said, I got a man for you. Talk about blind date. Talk about blind date. He said, I got a man for you back home. Now tell me why in the world would Rebecca, not knowing what Isaac looked like, would go all that way to be with Isaac. She was the first gold digger. <laughs> she saw that man roll up in his limousine, and she said, he's decked out. He's got on all the nicest clothes, and he's got all these jewels in his hands, and I have not seen his master, but I've seen what his master owns, and I'm telling you, if this is just the half, if the half hadn't been told, I'm willing to go meet him, and I'm willing to be his bride, because he's got the goods. And let me tell you, church, if anybody's going to come and join this church, and bring their little kids to Sunday school, and keep their kids off the street, and if these kids are going to come and get saved, under the preaching of the cross, we're going to have to show them the goods. Do we have the goods tonight? Are we showing the goods? Do we have what it takes to entice people to come to Truth Missionary Baptist Church? I wonder if they see the goods when they come in here. I wonder if we cap captivate their attention. You know, my little children, they do not care too much for just grown up movies. They get pretty bored. They get bored very easily. But if you put in something animated, something that lots of colors, lots of lights, and lots of music, it captivates their attention. 
I wonder if Truth Missionary Baptist Church captivates the attention of others. I wonder if when they drive across town or when they drive across and see Truth Missionary Baptist Church, if they see a place that has the goods. I wonder when they're working next to you week in and week out, if they see the goods and they want what you have. I wonder if when we're eating out, if they see us come in after church and if we show them the goods, I wonder if they see that. Do they see that in your life? Do others want what you have? We can captivate their attention and we can win others to Christ by doing just that, by captivating the attention of others. Paul did that, but also he compelled their acceptance in verses 8 through 12. He said, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine, in mine own bowels. Thou therefore receive him. Paul compelled their acceptance. Paul did not say, hey, I wish you'd take him back. Paul does not say, hey, it'd be nice if you'd take him back. Paul did not say, hey, I know he did you wrong, but would you please take him back? Paul said, no, I know he did you wrong, but you take him back just like I came back. When he comes back and he comes down with his head lifted down, you lift it up. When he comes back, knowing he did you wrong, you accept him as if it were me. Paul said, you do it. You, I'm telling you, you do it. Now I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you for love's sake, when a sinner comes across your path, don't run him down. When your brother across the church does you wrong, don't cut him down. I'm telling you for love's sake, let's love one another. Let's forgive one another. Let's like Paul, let's compel each other to love our brother and love our sister. If we're going to help others, if we're going to affect our community, if we're going to reach anyone for the Lord Jesus Christ, we must compel each other. For love's sake, to love one another. That's what Paul did. When Simon of Serene was compelled to carry Christ's cross, he, he was not asked. He was not asked, will you please come carry Christ's cross? No, he was compelled. That Roman soldier had the authority to beat that man if he did not carry Christ's cross. And that man knew it. When they said, carry Christ's cross, you pick up that cross and you carry it, he knew good and well if he did not carry that cross, he was in for a whooping sure enough. And can I tell you, if we do not uh, compel others to come in, we are in, a, in for a whooping from the Lord. His word tells us and his word compels us. And our preacher, he preaches week in and week out to love one another, to forgive one another, to, to love your brother, love your sister. And if we do not do that, we're in for a whooping sure enough. We must. We must do this. It is our duty. Paul compelled their acceptance. He was like my mama, my daddy's mama. When I was coming up, she always had some kind of vegetable soup, some kind of cornbread, some kind of homemade oatmeal cookies, and it didn't make a, it didn't make a difference if you were hungry or not. You're going to eat it. Anybody have a grandma like that? It didn't matter if he was hungry or not. You was going to eat it because she said so. She did not ask me if I wanted it to eat. She said, Joseph, here, here's some vegetable soup. Here's a glass of milk. Here's some cornbread. Here's some oatmeal cookies. I said, Mama, I'm full. She said, eat this, Joseph. She compelled me to eat. And that's what Paul did. He said, you receive this man. And can I tell you, in love, we must forgive one another. Can I tell you, in love, we must reach the people down the street. We must reach that person down at Walmart. Our pastor does not ask us to do that. Our Lord and Savior does not ask us to do that. But rather, He compels us and He urges us in love to reach others. And we can do it. We can do it by compelling one another and encouraging one another. But can I ask you this? Do you have the clout? Do you have the clout at work when you compel someone, hey, come to church. You should come. You should bring your children. Come on to church. Do you have the clout that they would accept that? I hope I do. I hope when I compel others to come to church and to accept Christ, they don't laugh at me because of my character. I hope I have the clout that compels others 
Paul did, but also he considered their affairs in verses 13 through 16. He said, Whom I would have retained, this Onesimus, I would have retained him with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul cared more about that church and about Philemon than he did himself. I wonder if we care more about this brother than we do ourselves. I wonder if you care more about this person over here than you do yourself. Do we? Do we consider the affairs of others? The Bible says that we're to prefer one over another. And can I tell you that a great man once said, people will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. People will not come to this church until they know this church is a loving church. Amen. Little boys will not listen to me in Sunday school. High school boys will not listen to me in Sunday school until they see Joseph actually gives a rip about them. I wonder if Truth Missionary Baptist Church is the kind of church that actually cares about its community, about those little kids that do hunger, about th those adults that are suffering uh, from broken families, that are suffering from drug addictions. I wonder if they actually can tell we care about them. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what Paul did. He considered the affairs of others. He considered the affairs of this church. He considered the affairs of Onesimus above his own. He was locked up in jail, but he was thinking about a boy that was hurting. He was thinking about a boy who was downtrodden, that ended up in jail, and that ended up uh, messed up, but he didn't think about himself. He thought about a boy he met in jail. I wonder if our problems are bigger than someone else's problems. I wonder if we actually care about theirs more than ours. I got a cousin named Richard Turner, uh, Bobby's grandson. The lady that prays for me every day, her grandson's a lot like her. He's got a t-shirt that says, smart eloquently, yeah, how about I just drop everything I'm doing and help you? But you know what? As funny as that is, Richard, he really is like that. Richard Turner will drop everything he's doing to help Joe Blow down the street. Richard Turner will drop everything he's doing and come to you in the middle of the night and help you get your car out of the road. He will do anything he can for you. And that's why everybody loves Richard Turner. Everywhere I've ever seen him go, he's had clout in the community. Why? Because this man considered the affairs of others. What about me? I wonder if Joseph Troll is the kind of person that considers the affairs of others. What about you? Do you think about others above yourself? That's what Paul did. Paul considered the affairs of others. And that's how he reached others. And truth missionary, we can reach others. First, by captivating their attention. Second, compelling their acceptance. Third, considering their affairs. And lastly, clearing their accounts. In verses 17 through 19, Paul cleared the accounts of this boy. He said, Church, if thou count me therefore a partner... Receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or if he oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Paul said, hey, forgive him, because I've forgiven him. Let's not hold it against him. Paul said, let's clear the accounts of others. Receive him as myself. And did you know that Jesus was the same way? Paul was just living out the way Jesus lived. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And when Jesus crouched down and washed those nasty feet, those feet of every one of those disciples, what he was doing is yet saying, yes, you are scallywag. Yes, you are low down. But do you know, now that I've washed your feet, you can have fellowship with me. Now that I have washed your feet, now you're my disciple. And now we can commune together. You're no longer a scallywag. Amen. You may be from the other side of the tracks, but we ain't going to mention it no more. And can I tell you the truth, missionary, when we bring people in and when visitors come in and when we go out and witness and try to bring them to Christ, we must find them as a scallywag. We must find them as a drunk. We must find them as a harlot. We might find them with a needle in their arm, but let's bring them in. And when God cleans them up, let's not hold it against them. Let's not hold it over their head. Let's not say, hey, you know, she used to be a hooker. Let's not say, hey, they're from the other side of the 
tracks. No, God said, uh, what, what I have cleansed, let not man call common. Hey, he may have used to be a scallywag, but now he's a child of the king. He may have used to be a drunk, but now he's a saint of God. I may have used to be nasty. I may have used to be unclean, but now I've been made white by the blood of the lamb. We cannot hold these things, the past of others over their head, or we'll never fill this church. We'll never reach our community if we don't let people get away from their past. Jesus said to Peter, He said, you go down to that house and you give them this message. What God hath cleansed, let not man call common. She may have used to have been a hooker. Now she's singing in the choir. Now she's a saint of God. If we're going to reach people, we must clear some accounts. I believe there's some accounts that are too long. I believe somebody over here might have an account over here for somebody that's about that long. And this church won't grow until we rip it up. Amen. The account over here for this person over here, it's about that long. And you've liked to have it tucked away so the next time they do something, you can pull it out and show somebody over here that their account's getting longer. But our church isn't getting any stronger until we start ripping up some accounts. We need to start forgiving one another. We need to start having some, some clearing some accounts. It's high time. We have a spring cleaning. I think it's about June and we're a little late. But the Lord said, if you be kind one to another, forgiving one another, preferring one another, and we live in unity with one another, we can grow. We can grow in Truth Missionary Baptist Church. Our pastor can be encouraged when he starts to see visitors getting along with our, new, with our members. And when our members start welcoming in new people and we start clearing some accounts. Stop holding things against people. I wonder, I wonder who's ready to rip one up tonight. Who has an account tonight against so-and-so, Susie Q, Johnny, Johnny Be Good, and it's time to cut it up tonight. Who wants this church to grow? Who wants to reach our community? All right. If you have something against your brother or sister tonight, let's clear it out. Let's forgive one another. You know, they might have said something mean, but how important is that? Isn't it more important that we win souls? I wonder how many souls hadn't been won this year just because we've been holding something against somebody. I wonder how many souls we failed to reach this year because we, we're more worried about what so-and-so did. I wonder if our community could be reached. I wonder if this church could be full from wall to wall if we had just loved one another. We can reach others. We can reach others for Christ by captivating their attention, compelling their acceptance, considering their affairs, and by clearing their accounts. We can reach the entire world. Do you know we can reach this entire world? One person at a time. Did you know if we reach one person, we can reach an entire family? And if we reach a family, we can reach this community. And if we reach this community, we can reach Greenville as a city. And if we reach this entire city, we can shake the entire county. 247,000 people could be turned upside down if we'd reach one person. And if we reach Greenville County, we can reach the state of South Carolina. And we do not have to be a homosexual marriage kind of state. It's going that way, but it don't have to if we just reach one person. If we start with one person, we might can reach our state. And if we reach our state, we might can salvage this country. And just just think, if we were to salvage this country one last time before Christ comes, what we could do to this world. But it will start with one person, maybe a little kid down there in Awanas, maybe somebody on the back row, maybe somebody down Saluda Dam Road. Just one person, and maybe we could reach them if we just master a few skills, just a few people skills. How about it, church? Who's willing to hone on these skills and master them? for the glory of Jesus Christ and for His kingdom. I pray that we can all do that for the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe He'll give us the power to do that. He's given us not the spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. Let's say every head bowed and every eye closed. Sammy Jr., you come and dismiss us. If anybody has an account they want to rip up, if they want to forgive somebody, tonight's a good night to do it. If anybody needs to come and pray, if anybody needs to be shown from the Scriptures how they need to be saved, I'll be here at the altar with a Bible. 
And Sammy Jr. is going to lead us in a word of prayer and dismiss us. Amen. <clears throat> the altar, the altar is open. If anybody like to come, you come now. We will not sing any invitation. Our heads bowed, eyes closed. But if anybody like to come to the altar, the altar is open as we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you for the challenging message from your word tonight. Dear Lord, we just pray that we'll all get the burden uh, of lost souls of others, that we'll go out into this community. Lord, we thank you for the visitors that are here tonight. We thank you for the visitors and the young couples and the elderly couples that are coming now that are interested in Truth Missionary Baptist Church. Lord, help us to grow, not for our glory, but for yours. Dear Lord, help us to win souls. That's what we're here for. Dear Lord, nothing pleases me more. The Bible says that even the angels in heaven rejoice over one soul that is saved. And dear Lord, we should rejoice when somebody comes to you. And Lord, that's our desire here is to win souls for thee. Thank you for the message tonight. Dear Lord, uh, forgive us of our, our frailties, our imperfections. Help us to have fellowship with you. Bring us here Sunday morning in Sunday school. Bless our Sunday school. Thank you for a pastor that preached on Sunday school the other night, cleared some things. Dear Lord, I, I appreciate a pastor that has a desire to teach our children the right way. So, dear Lord, help us to back our pastor. Bless him and his wife uh, this week that they'll have a restful time. Bring him back uh, revived, ready to preach. Dear Lord, give him good health. Continue to bless him. Bless us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.